Good evening. What a wonderful, terrific crowd. We should do this every month. I'm Barbara Freed, uh, chairman of the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. And on behalf of former and present board members who are here, our staff, and Dr. Sandy Treadway, who's the librarian of Virginia, maybe the best title in the state, we welcome you. Thank you to all of you who support us and to the library. And remember, there is a reception in the atrium following the program. We especially want to recognize the many members of the General Assembly who are here. Congressman Bobby Scott, I believe, is here. Eldon Burton from Senator Warner's office. And God bless him, Governor McAuliffe, who is coming here tonight <laughs> to join us, members of his cabinet, and Lieutenant Governor Northam. Backstory success is part of VFH's history and the work we have been doing over the past 40 years. Our programs originate in Virginia but they resonate beyond. Because in exploring the past and discovering the future, we examine our history and the changing nature of our communities in the Commonwealth. And we owe a great deal to the bipartisan support given by the General Assembly and the Executive Mansion over these past for decades. It is a very real pleasure to introduce our Lieutenant Governor, a native of the Eastern Shore where VFH is developing a network of the Eastern Shore Museums. And in addition to being Chairman of the Governor's Mental Health Task Force and Chairman of the Commonwealth Council of early childhood success. The Lieutenant Governor is also Vice Chairman of the Fort Monroe Authority. Now the major focus or initiative of the Fort Monroe Authority is to disseminate the story of enslavement and then freedom. The first slaves in America were brought to Fort Monroe and the first slaves to be freed were freed at Fort Monroe. The project for which we have been a consultant is of very special interest to the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. Please welcome Lieutenant Governor. Thank you so much, Barbara, for that kind introduction and welcome to all of you. And uh, as Barbara said, uh, I've been filling in uh, for the last few days uh, for uh, our governor, and we were so happy uh, this morning when he was released from the hospital, and, and uh, we just appreciate all of the well wishes and the, the thoughts, and uh, he will be here momentarily, and uh, he has, uh, to his credit, continued to do the work of the Commonwealth even while he was in the hospital. He's a special person. And he's a dedicated and determined person. So uh, we thank him and I will thank him uh, when we see him for, for all that he's doing for the Commonwealth. I just wanted to, to offer a few brief comments. And first of all, thank Barbara and Rob for all that you have done uh, for the uh, Foundation for Humanities and, and what that has done with your board for the Commonwealth of Virginia, just really bringing people and ideas together uh, and making the, the Commonwealth of Virginia a better place to live. And, and 40 years is uh, to, to congratulate you on. And I'm pleased to tell you all that the Commonwealth has supported uh, the Foundation for the Humanities for the last 36 years, including the, the great radio shows that you're getting ready to, to witness, Backstory. And that is certainly commendable. A couple other points that I just wanted to make some, some contributions that uh, the foundation has made. 
uh, one of which is this embracing the digital uh, world and, and using technology to reach out and to really reiterate the history of Virginia, which is rich, not only for those that live in Virginia, but in other states and in other countries. So that is certainly commendable. A second area that I am particularly uh, interested in is, is what the humanities does for our veterans. And I served for a total of 11 years in the United States Army. I, I served during Desert Storm. I understand uh, as well as anybody the impact of war. And so I appreciate what the foundation has done in, in telling the stories uh, of war and, and, and the impact of, of war on, on humanity and, and on our society. And then uh, finally, I, I did have uh, an ask uh, for uh, Mr. Vaughn and Ms. Freed and, and your board. Um, and that is one thing that you have already mentioned, and that is Fort Monroe. And Governor McAuliffe and I and the Fort Monroe Authority are intent on making Fort Monroe the best national monument uh, in this country. As you all probably know, uh, when the BRAC uh, went through, uh, Fort Monroe uh, was uh, given to the Commonwealth of Virginia and also to the United States. President Barack Obama uh, made Fort Monroe a, a national monument. And there is a tremendous story to tell in Fort Monroe, the, the history. And, and if you've not been to Fort Monroe, I would certainly encourage it. But the Fort Monroe Authority is, is diligently uh, working to, to bring that story together. And as Barbara said, it is where slavery started in this country and where slavery ended. And so we are determined to, to tell that story. And so my ask is to continue to work uh, with the Foundation for Humanities and, and help us get that word out because it is a, a tremendous story that, that we need to tell. So I thank you uh, for allowing me just to, to say a few words. And, and again, thank you uh, for all that you do and, and congratulations to the Foundation for 40 great years. And we certainly look forward to working you with, with in the next years and uh, well into the future. So thank you all so much. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Young. For a number of years, I had the privilege of serving on the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities Board and twice chairing it. During that time, and more recently, I have visited many other humanities organizations around the country. I can tell you that in the past 40 years, Rob Vaughn's reputation has grown, as it continues to grow, as a visionary among the state's humanities councils. But it is here in Virginia where we have been truly blessed by his contributions. As the founding and only president of the VFH, Rob brings the gifts of innovative ideas, inspired leadership, and the determination to see that the reach of the humanities touches every citizen of the Commonwealth. He and the foundation staff, under his guidance, have created significant and lasting partnerships, such as the one we celebrate this evening with the Library of Virginia. Countless other organizations, including Virginia's institutions of higher education, schools, museums, libraries, public radio stations, Indian tribal councils, community centers, businesses, and folk life groups have joined with the foundation to establish programs that enrich an ever-growing number of lives. Whether you know the foundation through its internationally famous Virginia Festival of the Book, Encyclopedia Virginia, with good reason, backstory, which we're about to enjoy, the foundation's many publications and CDs, or the many regional and local programs supported by Virginia Foundation grants, you can be sure the ideas that spawned these initiatives came from Rob and were supported by Rob. In fact, I think I could say in all the years I've known him, it's safe to say Rob has never met an idea he didn't like. For 40 years, he has shown us how the humanities use language, reason, and imagination to interpret the world around us. Speaking, I am sure, for past and present board members, many of whom are here tonight, 
the foundation staff, and all those who've been collaborators in the rich life of the Virginia Foundation, we want to pay tribute to Rob Vaughn this evening. So please join me in a round of applause for Rob. Now, I understand we are still waiting for the governor. Is that, is that correct, Maggie? All right, he should be here in just a few moments, so uh, I'm going to exit the podium and we'll keep our fingers crossed and the program will start after his remarks, if I'm correct. Thank you. It appears our, our governor is here and it's a real pleasure to introduce him. A governor who speaks about building a new Virginia economy wherever he goes and I could bet in the hospital he was telling them that too. <laughs> and he always makes clear that learning is the foundation for growing and diversifying our economy. More importantly, he understands that learning is a lifetime and a lifelong experience. He has successfully pursued federal funding to expand our pre-K program to include an additional 16,000 children. And he encourages all Virginians to make education a lifelong pursuit. It is my great honor to introduce Governor Terry McAuliffe. Hey, Governor, how are you? How's everybody? Sit down, everybody. What an honor to be with you. It's great to be. Let's give Barbara Freed a great round of applause. Is she not the greatest? It is great to see Lieutenant Governor here. You know, he was supposed to assume some duties for me tonight. I took a couple back tonight. Ralph, I want you to know I'm back. Uh, they, they, they wheeled me into the surgery two days ago. True story. And they had everybody lined up in the hallways, doctors, nurses, police, everybody there. And as they wheeled me through the last door about to put me under, I said, don't let Ralph near my signing pen for two hours. <laughs> and, uh, it would have been great, but he didn't get to sign anything uh, while I was under. It's great to be with everybody. Uh, Honored to be here with you tonight. I do want to congratulate uh, the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities on its 40th anniversary. Let's give that a great round of applause. Uh, the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities has played such a crucial role in connecting people and ideas together and here in Virginia, but not only here, but all across the United States of America. I am so proud that the state has supported this important organization for 36 consecutive years, including financial backing for two outstanding radio programs, the first you know with good reason, and then of course, backstory with American History Guys. These are just two of the programs that enrich our Commonwealth, and I also on behalf of all the citizens of the Commonwealth want to say thank you to the foundation for doing it. It has done so much to enrich all of our lives here in the Commonwealth. The other important community programs include uh, the VFH Center for the Book, the Virginia Festival of the Book, the Virginia Arts of the Book Center and Communities, our Commonwealth. VFH also has embraced the digital age with initiatives like Encyclopedia of Virginia, Documents Compass, which provides tools to create digital copies of historical documents, and of course, the EDUI Conference for Web Professionals serving higher education, libraries, and museums. Uh, there are many other programs that uh, I could highlight. I don't want to go through all of them, but I did want to come by today. Uh, this is my second official act since they finally released me a few hours ago. I showered, got a new suit on, and off I came to see you. But obviously, I did want to come by here because this is really an important anniversary, and I did not, uh, folks, want to miss it. Uh, I do want to reiterate the contributions and programs that you have done has really also highlighted the contributions of so many important Virginians, as well as the African American community, the Virginia folk life, and the Virginia Indians. I am particularly appreciative of the projects that were supported by the foundation that focus on veterans and the impact of war. VFH has provided funding and equipment to military historian Art Beltrone and photographer Lee Beltrone to interview 
Vietnam veterans and to record their stories. They are such rich histories. As part of the project, the Beltrones also documented graffiti from the General Nelson M. Walker troop ship, which was about to be destroyed. And before they destroyed it, they said, no, 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 this graffiti is way, way too important and such an important part of our history. And they have preserved the names and hometowns of these Vietnam veterans, drawing. <laughs> I guess they couldn't put all of the drawings in. I will leave it at that. Let your imagination go from there. But uh, many of them did drawings of their girlfriends and um, song lyrics, which were all inscribed onto the quadruple decker bunk beds on those ships. Uh, their interviews with veterans were shared on the radio with good reason just last year. And that is just one of the many wonderful projects that have been supported by the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. So you all here are supporters. You should all be very proud. And I look forward uh, to the next 40 years. Uh, I doubt I will be governor 40 years from today, but I'll come back. And I don't know what I'll be doing then, but maybe I'll have a proclamation some other job at that point. But uh, I will be back. Uh, but I would like now, if uh, Barbara could come back up now and Robert Vaughn could come up, I would like to present a proclamation to recognize the foundation for their 40 year anniversary and their tremendous contributions to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you. All right, now we're back. All yours, Lieutenant Governor. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Governor. We're delighted he could be with us. Well, we're about to begin the main event. Backstory with the American History Guys is a national public radio program and podcast produced out of the Humanities Studios in Charlottesville. And tonight's anniversary program features a special treat, a staged show by the hosts of Backstory, Ed Ayers, Peter Onuf, and Brian Ballo. The trio is about to do something that almost seems counterintuitive. They'll delve into the past to make sense of the future. You'll find their bios in the Backstory flyers you received when you entered the auditorium. They are all brilliant scholars and authors, as well as being highly engaging and a lot of fun on the radio. Ed serves as president and professor of history at the University of Richmond and was awarded the 2013 National Humanities Medal. Peter is the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Professor of History at UVA and senior research fellow in Jefferson Studies at Monticello. And Brian is UVA's Compton Professor of History and chair of the National Fellowship Program at the University's Miller Center for Public Affairs. Brian, Peter, and Ed, and a talented staff of eight produce a weekly show that is now broadcast in 159 communities in 25 states and Washington, D.C., including 11 top 50 markets. The show is broadcast by three stations, WCBE, Radio IQ, and WRIR in Richmond. In the last six months, iTunes has featured Backstory three times on the main banner of its podcast page, where the show has risen to as high as number 14 in the universe of podcasts, both video and audio. As of a few days ago, Backstory had registered 5.9 million all-time downloads, and its podcast subscribers numbered more than 43,000. If you are not already a fan, you are about to become one. So welcome, Backstory to the Future, live. From the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, this is Backstory with the American History Guys. Meet Ed Ayers. He's Paul Bryan. On off the history guys meet Ed Ayers. He's Pal Brian. Peter Onoff. 
<laughs> Welcome to the show. I'm Brian Ballow, and I'm here with my pal Peter Ono. Hey, Brian. And my buddy Ed Ayers is here hey, too. We're coming to you with a special live episode of our show, and we're recording it at the Library of Virginia here in Virginia's capital city, Richmond. As you certainly know, because you all listen to the show, each week we take a topic from the America of today, that would be right now, and spend an hour exploring its historical context. Today we have in store for you a little twist on that model because the topic we're historicizing, that's a fancy word for, we're giving it a history, and this will go down in history, the show, it's <laughs> the future! So the future's a little different for us, and we got something else different. We have pictures. In fact, no. after intense <laughs> lobbying for the 20th century, we even have not, video. Not not moving, moving pictures? pictures. <laughs> moving pictures. And we're gonna kick things off with a video clip that we grabbed, actually stole, uh, from an episode of the HBO series last week with John Oliver. It's going to remind you of America's favorite futuristic family. You guessed it, the Jetsons. <laughs> they did guess it. They did guess it. And now this. And now, newscasters using a 50-year-old reference to talk about the future. <laughs> You know, we sort of gauge everything right in life based on how close we come to the Jetsons. Remember the Jetsons, the family flying in their car? The Jetsons, right? Remember that cartoon? Technology is going to make it so that we only work four days a week. Yep. The Jetsons. Does anyone other than the Jetsons and some people in Silicon Valley do this? It's, it's like the Jetsons. Jetsons. It's, it's like the Jetsons. It's like uh, from the Jetsons. Don't you think it's like the Jetsons? George Jetson and <laughs> what was the name of the dog? What was the name? Elmo. Oh, how, how could I forget? Oh, Astro. Astro. <laughs> Astro? Astro was the name of the drop. Bar oh, yeah, it was an Elmo. <laughs> <laughs> that was a different little kid. Yeah. <laughs> when people romanticize the Jetsons, they're romanticizing the past as much as they are the future. And one of the fascinating aspects about the Jetsons is just how conservative it is. That last voice you heard is belongs to a guy named Matt Novak, and he runs a blog for Gizmodo named Paleo Future, and he's really into the Jetsons. On his show, blog, in fact, you can read synopses of every single episode from the 1960s. Not now, uh, but later when we're not doing this. Turn off your machines. And Matt joined us in the studio recently to share what he feels, in case you're wondering, is the central paradox of the Jetsons. Uh, we live in a world of flying cars and jetpacks, and yet uh, there is no social change. There are no people of color in the Jetsons. Uh, Jane, the mother, doesn't work outside of the home. Everything that you would imagine to change in this vision of the future is all technological. It's arguably all on the surface. Now, just in case you're having a little bit of trouble remembering the details of those episodes from half a century ago, <laughs> Uh, we're going to help you out with this short video clip just to set up the scene. Uh, George and Jane, his wife, decide that if they're really going to be a family of the future, well, they've just got to have a maid. And why do they need a maid? Well, Jane's technique with the buttons isn't what it quite used to be. Well, good morning, George. Morning, Jane. Oh, what is this, anyway? What's it taste like, George? Well, this coffee tastes like rocket fuel. And your eggs? They're cold. I don't get it. When we first got married, you could punch out a breakfast like Mother used to make. Now you're all thumbs. It's not my thumbs, and it's not me. It's this antique monster. <laughs> well... This was the way we did research for our future show. <laughs> we, I gotta admit, we had a really good time. But it doesn't take much research for Peter and Ed to start spinning out really interesting theses about how history works. And the one that we've come up with for this evening is that often visions of the future are really a way to read the past in a selective fashion. 
so what do I mean by that when we think about the clip that we just saw? Well, for one thing, honestly, what middle class families have maids in 1964? This is reading in a selective vision of the past that in some ways goes back to the 19th century. Uh, married women are re-entering the workplace in, 19, in the early 1960s. They're not uh, staying home cooking uh, for their husbands. And we also decided that more often than not, these selective readings of the past are forwarded in order to mask deep concerns about the present. Oh, nobody was worried in the early 60s. No, no nobody no. said, so, so let's see, what, seen, what might people be worried about? Nuclear holocaust? Nuclear <laughs> holocaust. <laughs> and much closer to home and immediate, since the Jetsons present this very conservative vision of social relations, people were very troubled, some were very excited about, but people were arguing and debating about radical shifts in the social structure as this was going on. They were talking about the civil rights movement, they were talking about civil disobedience in the streets, and here you have this all white, quote, perfect family from, oh, let's say maybe the 50s, but really much of the century before, talking about the future when you have all of this social turmoil going on right in front of your eyes. So for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to test out this thesis that we've come up, come up with. We're going to consider some of the ways that this dynamic has played out over the course of history. And boy, are you lucky, because we're going to do it with a little futuristic time travel. And we're going to time travel right here in Richmond. Don't worry, I promise to get you right back here to Broad <laughs> Street. And in fact, we're not going to go that far from Broad Street, but we're going to cruise up and down Broad Street, east, west, but more importantly, back to the future. Now, Peter and I would love to claim to be Richmonders, but you know that we're not. Uh, I have to tell you, I had a terrific lunch at Pearlie's Delicatessen. It was great food. How do you feel about it now? And, well, to demonstrate <laughs> that it was an authentic Jewish meal, I have massive indigestion. And that is, that is the ultimate compliment for any great Jewish meal. Ed, on the other hand, not quite a native, but he's been in Richmond for a long time, and he knows it inside out. So Ed, he is going to be our tour guide today. Strap on your jetpacks. We're going for a trip. Ed, where are we going first? Well, it's not that far, so you won't burn <laughs> up too much of your fuel. We're going to go down to the eastern end of Broad Street to St. John's Church, where in many ways Richmond's history begins. And it's kind of a problem because, as everybody knows, St. John's Church doesn't look very modern, so that's why we have this guy who's going to help us figure out why would we begin a show with this? It doesn't really fit. Yeah, give, give me a chance. <laughs> they had a future back then, and we are their future, we might say. We congratulate ourselves on that. Give me liberty or give me death, the immortal words of Patrick Henry said right there in St. John's Church. Well, that's a vision of the future, Ed, Brian. Liberty, future, death, well, that's the past. I'm looking you don't have to sell me. The, the revolution. I got yeah. it. Future. I don't see the past, though. Were you not paying oh, attention you know, to you, the thesis that I just laid out? You can't separate them, Brian. There is nothing more futuristic than imagining a world turned upside down on its side. Hierarchy destroyed. Now we have equality. Did you hear that? All men are created equal. What a radical transformative notion. But what did these Virginians, what did these Americans dream of when they dreamed of their future? They dreamed of, well, a new and improved British Empire. Empire. <laughs> that was their vision of the future. These people come from one of the smallest places on the planet, a little island where there's not enough land to go around. You look west, you have abundant land, and you imagine Everybody wants to be a king. Everybody wants to be an aristocrat. Everybody wants to own broad acres. And you need to work them. Everybody wants to have the labor, to own the labor, to own the slaves that will enable you to work them. You got a problem here, Brian. Ed, we got to figure this one out. All right, right. I'm ready. Because on one hand, we have a vision of the future we can identify with, that we can celebrate. 
That's that wonderful onto the Pacific. Yeah, a beautiful. But then there's this other thing, and that is what do people really want? You can only imagine yourself as you are now into a future with more of what you've got. So on the one hand, you have principles that can be used to dissolve hierarchy, to destroy ch the established church, to destroy all notions, traditional notions of social order. That's the radical revolution. On the other hand, you have, well, a continent cleared of aboriginal people, native proprietors, so that we can be fruitful and multiply. We have a domestic slave trade. The population doesn't end even though we talk anti-slavery, even though Thomas Jefferson eloquently says it's unjust, it must be abolished, they must be emancipated. That is the only kind of future that he can imagine, but he wants it and Americans want, and people right here in Richmond wanted it both ways. They wanted the best of the past and that best of the past is something that we, in retrospect now, condemn and abhor. So, wait a minute. Yeah, so what you're saying, heavy. I'm yeah, sorry. What's it was heavy? supposed That's to be a funny right. show, right? Yeah, no, no, well, it <laughs> no, I but, apologize. But, no, you don't, because <laughs> here's the thing. So we imagine sometimes that all that bad stuff you were talking about was just sort of like, it's too bad, it was the baggage of the past that they no. pictured. But what you're saying, that's actually they what the future was. They are wants. inextricably right. linked. And All we right. want to know what their future is and how they can see it. They can only see it, they can only imagine it in terms of the realities they were living. It was a projection of their present and a selective suppression of the past. You killed the king. What bigger change could there be? You've changed everything. The world is turned upside down. Yeah. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah, uh, that's but good we, we, we got a lot of Broad Street left to see. So, let, don't let, you want to stay at St. John's Church <laughs> no, for a let, while? Let's go, let's give, go. Me give me more time, or give me death. I want to know where the next stop is. Ed. Well, Sorry, then, Peter, uh, sit down. All right, all right. And they, they, buckle up. Uh, no, but this is live. They can see us. It's exciting, <laughs> isn't it? And really, kind of alarming. It's why, we, it's why we do radio, <laughs> Peter. That's right. More the fact that I think we're. I don't really want to think about what we look like. But nevertheless, let's go to the next oh. site. And it's not that very far. You can actually see it from St. John's Church if you look to the west. And what you're seeing there is the shiny new capital that comes to, into place after this revolution is successful. Yeah, shiny new capital. It's up there someplace. A capital that is modeled on the best of ancient Roman architecture. There it is. Yeah, the Maison Carré in Nîmes. And I want to tell you this, Ed. Modern architecture, oh, Peter? It is modern. You know why it's modern? Because the principles of good architecture are timeless. Oh, wow, And you build thing. that capital, and it'll be there two centuries, two and a half centuries later. That's and what Brooks Brothers, Brothers says, new, Peter. <laughs> all men are created equal. Does that seem fresh and new to you? Neoclassical yeah. architecture? Does that, if it, well, I don't know. It's not <laughs> quite the same, but Jefferson thought it was the same thing. Well, I'm sorry that we put, put a picture up here when it's not finished, uh, because we all know that it has those wings on the side, but I guess this is the way that Jefferson didn't have enough money to finish it, but this is... Well, the, they forgot to do that at Neem yeah. also. But, but, <laughs> but what this is, is this is actually a picture from another revolution, Brian. Uh, this is a picture of when this Ooh. became the capital of what was going to be a glittering new nation that would set world history off on a new direction. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Built yeah. Up. what are you oh, talking oh, 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 about? Time out, time out. I accept. Yeah, I accept he's willing Peter's to get excited about bricks my, and yeah, mortar right, and right. eternal yeah. architectural yeah. principles, a la Brooks Brothers fashion. Right, okay? right, right. But oh. I cannot accept that a nation state built on the oldest form of labor, slavery, is somehow forward looking. Well, that's the Confederate States of America. That's just the, the point that they made. We're going to be able to do what the founding fathers weren't able to do, which is to combine the proven success of the past in slavery yeah. with a glittering future. And we know it's going to work, Brian, because all we have to do is go down the bottom of the hill in Tredegar, and you can see something that nobody else has really been able to pull off. We've got this labor system. It's proven all the way from the time of the ancients, but it's joined to making the most advanced technology of the modern world, so, actually making locomotives. And these Confederates think that they've solved the labor problem, the great struggle between capital and labor? Yeah. This well, is a, a better form of well, look, how, look how fast it's been able to spread, you know, mm -hmm. keeping pace with the North, racing, uh, racing the most valuable commodity in the modern mm -hmm. world. 
England and France and the American North are at the beck and call of this new society. They say, Brian, we create the Confederate States of America, perfect that constitution that we didn't get exactly right because we're kind of evasive about slavery. We nail that down. We're the fourth richest, fourth richest economy in the world. We will continue to expand. Cuba looks awfully close and very nice right there, mm. expanding to Central America. And they think we're going to reboot. And here's our chance to create a new nation. And they do create all the machinery of a new nation with remarkable speed. You want a, a huge army? We got that. You want a president? He's sworn well, in right here next to this building. And the American revolutionaries thought they were creating a new world order. The whole world would be better off. Can okay. the Confederates think that too? Yeah, they did. They, they said that they were going to create the most Christian nation on the face of the earth that was actually going to be able to fuse slavery in this. So, Brian, you know, so far, this trip down Broad Street's been kind of alarming. Um, but it's certainly been <laughs> eye-opening to me. Yeah, well, but, but if what it shows is that Richmond is on the cutting edge of both of these efforts in the late 18th century yeah. and the mid-19th century to try to reconcile Two what we... Two countries already, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Is the third one in the waiting? Yeah, yeah let, California. Let's go west, <laughs> young man. Let's keep going west. Uh, the, the city expands to the west and see what we might have next. Now, we're going to go pretty far down Broad Street right now. I uh, hope it's not rush hour, because one of the things <laughs> that we're going to see now is 1917. And in some ways, Peter, you might say, just show the, the power of the original Jeffersonian vision, is, because right. people are going to guess. You can see how far we have to go down Broad Street, but what you're going to see is, Ooh, beautiful. yeah. Oh, don't yeah. talk oh. about architecture again. Yeah, yeah, yeah Broad Street. Look at the symmetry. Oh. Look at the, the grace so of all big this. Too. It's big. Yeah. And this is, this is Broad Street Station. And this is how Richmond is once again at the cutting edge of history, Brian, because now you're going to have three rail lines joining in this Union Station. It's going to come together Broad Street Station, and it's going to usher Richmond, which is booming at the time. They developed cigarettes, mass advertising. Ooh, There's it. the I future, yeah. yeah. We're in the 20th century. Finally, <laughs> we're the, talking about things that sound, yeah. that, 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 they know, might matter. from ye or from your yeah, century. Where would the healthcare industry be modern. without cigarettes? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, but maybe modern. Maybe we're getting into the future. Stuff. Yeah, and you know, and this is the same time the fans being built. So Richmond in the early 20th century seems to really be on. So top should we of move it. on? Just no, the no, I'm afraid the same theme that we've been talking about reasserts itself here mm -hmm. because at this time, a statewide segregation law is less than 10 years old, and if you're going to regulate, and here's a modern idea for ooh, you, Brian, ooh. all I social relations yeah, regulation. so that people get along, century. you don't really have right. all this turmoil that you've had from African Americans and white Americans living together. What I mean, we're gonna we do wouldn't now, have to be on the same program. Well, no. <laughs> what we're going to do now is we're going to solve it by law mm. and by in a brand new building like this, carefully separating where black people go and wh where white people go. There won't be any push and pull and Classifying, time. data, all the very yeah. 20 big, big yeah. data, big data. Yeah. So this is forward looking at. Well, unfortunately, it is. And seven years after this, here in Richmond, Virginia creates a bureau that is not only satisfied with defining you in the current day, but goes back into your ancestry and makes sure uh. that nobody who's of not pure white blood is claiming to be. So these and, are history guys. Yeah, well, no, they're a different kind. And so, so this bureau, so here we are in 1917, you know, so we're more than a century from St. John's Church, yep. just a few blocks, but here on Broad Street. So You know, Ed, that reminds me so much of what Peter was saying about the land, mm -hmm. the, the key to the future, right. back at the time of the revolution, being just connected to the labor system, which was dragging along that past and how they were just absolutely tied up. You have the trains coming together at the station. Uh, you've written about the New South. This is what's connecting the Old South to the New South. At the same, literally. Literally. Yeah. At, at the same time, you have Jim Crow segregation and seen as a modern idea, but in fact with its roots deeply yeah. in enslaved people who had been tied to that And this is when land. they're putting up the, the monuments on Mon Monument Avenue. Yeah. So I'd like to take you to one more place, though. Please, uh, but, please uh, do that. Yeah, let, let, <laughs> and let, and, let, and let, while you're while you're driving the bus, yeah, can we go to some place that looks like the future? Okay, let's. So uh, I don't I have to listen can. to Peter it, talk about neoclassical. It does involve a U-turn, and I, in my experience, you can get away with it on Broad Street. 
in some places. So we're, we're going <laughs> we're gonna to take a U-turn and come back to a place that I have to admit Ooh. doesn't exist right now. Ooh. Brian, are you satisfied? I love it. Oh. I love All right. it. Does this look like the where'd Jetsons? Where did they, they get wow. the grapefruit from? Yeah, that's right. Well, it's, uh, it's the Jetsons. Look at that. Yeah, it's uh, perfect. And, uh, and, and you may say, well, what modern function is this building performing? Yeah. Uh, this is um, uh, the Centennial Building for the Civil War oh, in 1961. Oh, that's the Civil War. Uh, uh, well, it, nothing says Civil War like Princess phones. Hey, uh, look in there. Ed, oh, no. Ed, I am getting motion sickness here. Yeah. I mean, why would you build a futuristic grapefruit to celebrate the Civil because, War? Because, well, you'll see, well, maybe here's a hint, Brian. Okay. What is that? You should know this. Uh, it's, a Mer it's a Mercury oh, space capsule. It's a Mercury space capsule. Oh, God, I hey, love that's it. That's the future, right? It. It, well, every Civil War memorial needs a Mercury space <laughs> capsule <laughs> if it's really going to be complete. This man could sell anything. I could, you know. <laughs> Step right up. So tell me this, Brian, Mr. 20th Century. Why would there be a Mercury space capsule and Prince's phones and all this shiny new technology and a Jetson-shaped building at almost exactly the same time that the Jetsons are the big hit on television? Yeah. Why would they do that? I got it. OK. OK. It's the Cold War. Yeah. It is the Cold War. It's the Cold War getting warm? Yes. Yeah. OK. It's, it's, it's the Cold War, and at, a very, at the very time, that civil rights is getting started commemorating the Civil War, we need to show the unity of standing oh, and, together and, 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 and beating the Ruskies to the moon. And you Did I get an A? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I get an A? What the American dilemma, no, they didn't call it that. What the great problem <laughs> in American history was, it was sectionalism. It was the war between the North and the South. That's a healing therapeutic moment. Don't you feel better? No? no? I don't think they do, Peter. <laughs> so the idea was, hey, just like we're introducing our way into the 20th century with Broad Street Station, now we're going to introduce ourselves as really unifying the North and South here for the great that struggles would be of white Northerners. Well, and that's white right. Southerners. Well, at the very same time that this is happening, in fact, right on Broad Street, just a couple of blocks from here, would sit ins at Tallheimer's, in which mm -hmm. students from Virginia Union say, any future worth living in is going to have to be a future that moves beyond this bifurcation that we've seen, Brian. That you're going to have to have a just society that right. you guys promised us back at St. John's Church so many blocks and so many decades yeah, ago, yeah. right? And you can see that, so at the very same time this building is being designed and built, Brian, these are the things that are going on. So as you can see, one more time, the past, the present, and the future just cannot be separated. And, and I think that this kind of demonstrates another part of our thesis, which is people really start spinning out these futuristic visions when they're most uncomfortable about the present. I mean, at the time, if you're trying to bring the country together for the Cold War, yet you are facing what becomes a social revolution. So let's let's try to cover that up. Well, let me, let, me tell you, let, let me ask you this. Yeah. Do we live in anxious times now, my friend? Or, or do you feel nervous about what's well, going I on in the world? I was nervous before the show started. Yeah, well, I know that doesn't count. <laughs> I don't mean this very moment. I mean oh, oh, more oh. broadly. You mean I feel very then? nervous. You feel nervous? Yeah. Do you feel yeah, nervous feel about nervous. now? No, I'm too old. Yeah. <laughs> but let me tell you, I've got just a cure for your nervousness. Let's go the farthest we've traveled on Broad Street. Let's go to the far west end of Broad Street and see where that takes us. Because go, uh, well, you have to wait and see. Just, it, just, it, 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 there's no, quite a few red lights between. We don't have that Stop. many years left. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And you can see, boy, it's really big. Oh, uh, man. You know, that, oh, we're stopping short, for gas? So short pump is what that is. And it's, it's, a it's short pump. cheap now, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Or oh, what do you say? I, I get it. So oh, look at that. Man. We're building a new vision of Richmond's future and look how modern it looks. Ooh. I've got an idea. <laughs> what do you say that we pave the streets with bricks? And oh, what do you wow. say that the, the buildings in West Broad Village, which sounds a village. So, yeah, West Broad Village. It takes a village to and develop. And it looks exactly no. like the fan, <laughs> except new. Where's my hitching post? Yeah. <laughs> so you, you can see that we're still living in this oh, time nice. where we are thinking, how can we use the past to reclaim what's good about Richmond's history? Everybody loves the fan. People love this idea that we have all this great housing stock, that Richmond's a real place now, that you can walk to restaurants, you can go to a Jewish delicatessen, all that thing. We've got all this, 
And, but we're not so hungry now to build futuristic things now. Yeah. We recognize now that we need to anchor ourselves in the past. And this is the most reassuring vision of Richmond's past that the designers at well, Short we, Pump Town Centra. You, all the gadgets that the Jetsons pioneered will be available to you. And um, we will be signing up after the session if you're interested in the speculation. Well, I'm, you're, you're not kidding, right? Because you go in there, I guarantee yeah. you they got Wi Fi that we could, that would shame anybody uh, back in the days of the Mercury space. Well, well I want to turn to the audience and let you know that the future is now because in a minute or two, you're going to be able to ask questions. Uh, the Easy only, questions. The only limitation is that all the hard questions be directed at Ed and Peter. <laughs> okay? And so I want you to start thinking. But while you're thinking, I want to turn to my colleagues here and ask them what this all means. Well, we've seen a lot of futures, and they look pretty archaic to us, and we disown some of them. But these have all been dreams that people here in Richmond and Virginia have had about the future. And they have left legacies to us in the form of monuments and of buildings that we cherish, a part of the, the fabric of the cityscape. Yet each one of these futures is, as Brian suggested at the outset, highly selective. It's not a broad street. These have been narrow alleys that have led different groups of people into a future where they feel comfortable. And what's the real challenge here, I think, is, and this is where we need more of the kind of history that the VFH promotes, we need to recapture a plurality of histories and possible futures. And on top of that, it's not just that everybody can have his or her own history. We need to bring those histories together. It's the real challenge to broaden that street. Yeah, and Peter, I, yeah. I would just say, you know, if we think back to Ed's tour, Right. Every place we stopped really did bring a plurality of people together, right. not always in the way that we might have liked. But note that those were all public places. Right. Those were all places where Richmonders came together. That's right. Those are places that we and our ancestors have come together and will come together in the future. And those are places that need to be places of memory and opportunity and possibility for all of us because that's where we draw our image of the future. It's going to come from our understanding of the past. Well, you know, the VFH motto, explore the past, discover the future. And that's a, a surprising thing for a lot of people. We don't live in the past because we like it better, that we wish we were there. We don't, I don't love the Civil War. Uh, well, I don't why wish. Why do you study this? Well, because it's the, the center of the pivot of our nation's history. Peter. Oh, was that all? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> But, but the point is, is that there are... Go to my website for my rebuttal to that. <laughs> there are so many histories that we're just now discovering that lay out different visions of the future that can sustain us more going forward. Yeah. And so I think uh, we need a, a real broad street for this. We need a broad street where everybody has a place, and a broad street that um, we, we can all imagine to a future that includes everybody. But the, the future that includes everybody right now yeah, you is the are future, our future that we threatened. We're Bring looking it on. for the first person to step up to this newfangled Bring modern it on. We have microphone. People, we have people with mics. They'll come to where you are. OK, I see a hand in the back. It in always back. makes me so nervous because somebody's very, eager to ask that. Very question. traditional mode of communication. We're sending a real person. Nina? Nina, in the back. As far away from In the back, possible. the hardest place to reach for you. <laughs> I love it when it's far away and builds the sense of drama. Tension What's this question building, yes. going to be? Ooh. Here we go. OK. I'm very anxious about the future. And I think one of the emblematic things are drones. Right. So I want you to talk about drones. <laughs> well, that's an 18th century well, actually, question, Peter. Oh, we asked this. You don't think you just heard three drones? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll join on for you. No, no, no. You know what no, I mean. We bombed in Richmond. <laughs> Brian, Brian comes the closest. You, you well, would you please take this seriously? We are getting ready to take this seriously. It's just a sharp pivot <laughs> to this. Brian? Yeah, I, I think that, honestly, for all of our periods, uh, one of the things that has changed history uh, and dragged us into the future often are changes in technology. Right. I think that war has become to t back me up on this, Peter, or argue with me, but I think war has become 
increasingly impersonalized over the course of all the three centuries that we cover. And war and, has been a great incubator for innovation and technological development. And sometimes even for social reform, right. believe it or not. In the case of the drones, I have trouble making that picture. Uh, but I, I do know that what frightens me the most about drones is thinking of the future, a world in which many countries are using drones. Often we embrace these new military technologies when we own them. Americans loved the bomb because it ended the war. Then when atomic bombs became commonplace, when they proliferated as the term goes, we didn't have such great feelings about them and I worry that the same thing will happen with drones. Well, the, the doubleness of all technological developments, we understand the darker side. And that's a, a moment of hesitation. We didn't mean to mindlessly embrace Jetson's gadgets as if it's self-evidently true, to borrow a phrase from my man, that all new ways of doing things are better. We are facing enormous challenges that transcend technology when we talk about connectivity and total presence, collective presence in, a, in each other's lives when we're all part of big data. It's scary. I, I'm glad I'm as old as I am, actually. I don't look forward to that future, and that may be the real challenge. And why, in some ways, it's inspiring to look to the past, because thinking through those possible futures, we can maybe recapture some of the hope and some of the optimism. I think the real challenge now is, is imagining a future, and maybe history is a, is a resource for us. You know, you think about the landscapes that we've just been exploring here. Wars are the places where, the sort of, we've mentioned them over and over again, yep. the sort of the, the, the defining point. Hot, what happen, hot and cold. That's right, but what happens to a war that leaves no memorials, that mm -hmm. we cannot even see our own soldiers there, that the losses and the sacrifices are invisible? So I think one reason that people like building a the future that looks like the past, I think it may be harder for us to envision a future than it has been yes. in the past. You know, we were kind of laughing about the Civil War centennial looking like 1961, but they thought the future would look like that, sleek, aerodynamic, streamlined. Now we believe that it will be highly mediated by technology in some ways, and the drone is the military manifestation of it. So. Uh, that's about as serious as we can get. So. <laughs> and, and from now on, will people ask 18th and 19th century questions? Apparently they weren't listening to the instructions. <laughs> what else we got? Uh, good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm relatively new to Richmond, but I find uh, an interesting uh, dynamic with uh, some residents or people that live within the area. I first thought it was interesting that you said the short pump um, housing was supposed to resemble the fan type. When I go there, I just never got that feel <laughs> from the housing. <laughs> uh, but interesting that you, you, you made that point. That was an actual picture of it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that look, that was West Broad Village, which I, is associated with short yeah, I had to look central. a little hard to capture the fan look in that. But yeah. You so, probably didn't arrive on horseback. That yeah. could be the problem. And I was looking for the hitching post. But Again, that was interesting that they made that connection or, or you know, that was some of the attempt. Um, what I find interesting is that the attitude, and this to me is connecting some of the, the history with the future mindset of some that are very familiar with the area, who um, when I say, oh, I'm going to go up to show up, and say, oh my God, you're going all the way up there? Like <laughs> it is really, really far. And they have a very serious disconnect with short pump and whatever's up there. So is that somewhat of uh, the an history type of mindset, not connecting with what is the future, which of course short pump is supposed to in some way represent? Yeah, if, if you would, uh, sometime if you have a little bit of extra time on your hands, uh, drive from one end of Broad Street to the other. And it's like a core sample of American history, okay? So mm -hmm. we, we've given you some things, but if you keep, hang a right at the wonderful Science Museum, and one thing I love is that the Science Museum takes that 1917 thing and turns it into the, one of the mo most exciting places in the yeah. city where we really can see the future, then you can start seeing 
1950s development, you'll start seeing the, what used to be the motor mile for the car dealers. Then you'll see the very first mall here at the shopping center, Willow, Willow Lawn. Then you'll start seeing the very first uh, kind of chain restaurants, you know, Arby's and things like that. Then you'll start seeing it move out into things that we recognize as more of ourselves. So if you've lived here for a while, you've sort of watched far out on Broad Street be the end of what development looks like right now. And so it's disconcerting to drive back through your childhood <laughs> whenever that was and back out the other side to short punch, which looks like nobody's childhood. You know? So I think that it does, it, A, it is a pretty long drive. There are quite a few stop signs. But it's also the case that it's a drive through, the, through history. And it's, you know, and come I think, back in 100 years and the, the new short pump will now be in a historic site. Yes. And people will cherish it. Yeah, and, and, and I'll just say that one of the things I love about doing this show is that when we think about history as professionals, it's usually 18th century history or 19th century history. But most of America is this amalgam of buildings from very different periods and symbols from very different periods. Uh, Peter, God knows, is a symbol from a very different period. Uh, and, and I love the fact that we don't, we, we don't, I didn't bring up your therapist. we don't have a conception of, of history which is everything looking exactly the same from the same period because there's really not much in America anyway that works out that way. And that's one of the things I love about history and it's, it's why I love hanging out with these guys. I do tend to think of things and 20th century terms and you know so just, shallow exactly <laughs> and, and they will force me to realize that there's this 18th century church right next to the gas station that I want to preserve yeah I think that's a really important point Brian I think most visions of the future that we've talked about are homogenizing exactly and unifying and projecting one thing into the future whether it's the color of the people the way they worship, whatever it might be, when the wonderful, unfathomable thing about the city, about the country is the, I don't want to sound platitudinous, but it's a real diversity. It's a granular diversity. It is us and where we came from. Great. Question right here. As, as uh, educators. Uh, one second. If, if you just hold on. For broadcast purposes. Yeah. As educators. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about your experiences and what you think of the future of online courses. Okay. Well, as it turns out, I'm teaching an online course right now uh, on the South and American history. And how's this for the future? I teach it from my home. Uh, how's it going so far? It's, it's been, I'm awesome. Uh, <laughs> so, but here's Do you thing. agree? <laughs> yeah! yeah. <laughs> that was and a moment. So here's the thing. So it's high school teachers of American history, and the other night, there I was sitting in my living room, in my study, and I broadcast out, and I'm just looking at a camera and hoping that it's going, and I get an email back from Beijing, where somebody's teaching American history there in real time. And then today, we found out that we need to send PDFs to somebody in Germany who's taking this. It's hard for me to see how that kind of online course taught for highly motivated adults who otherwise simply could not hear mm -hmm. the latest thing about American history is good. So I think that do I want it to replace the University of Richmond? No. Do I think it has a, a role to play? I do. Yeah. Peter, you've done I've, I've done one and I'm going to do the same kind of course Ed's doing right now. Not quite uh, as good. But. No, it won't be. It won't be awesome. <laughs> 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 but I will be awesome. No. Uh, and it has been, I was very skeptical. Most old people, uh, people like me, are very skeptical about new forms of pedagogy that are gonna displace people like me. Uh, and it's upsetting. Uh, academics are great in talking abstractly about the future of the world, but they don't want things to change at their university. Why? Oh, no tenure anymore? You don't need me, I'm redundant? Oh, it's our business is going to be automated and we're going to be, no, no good. But I, I'm with Ed. I think the opportunity of online education is to replace, for instance, the traditional textbook. You know, the first lectures, we have a lecture system that goes back to the Scottish Enlightenment, and it's because kids couldn't afford The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. 
So they listen to him read it. That's where lectures come from. We've come a long way, I think, since Adam Smith wrote that timeless classic that's still worth reading. But we can now deliver in a different way. What we don't want to lose is what we have with you tonight. And that is that sense of presence and connectedness. All good teaching, I think, finally depends on these intimate relations. And uh, we could have the best of both. But you know, and, and I want to go to the next question, but I'll just say this. When we began this, making the show, podcast didn't exist. And now, we're downloaded all around the world. How many a, times? A, a, nearly six million. Yeah. And what people say. And boy, is my thumb tired. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, Brian? And, and, and what people say they like about podcast is the sound of intimacy. I mean, I hope we're not completely ruining backstory for you guys by seeing what we actually look like yeah. <laughs> and, and what, what we're like unedited. Um, but uh, the, the fact is, is that technology can bring the same kind of human connection that we've had before. So maybe we're utopianist, but I, I, we've seen it and heard it. And, and, it and oddly work. enough, I'll add a late 19th century footnote, which is that that's when the large lecture was introduced to most great universities. Mm -hmm. And people mm -hmm. were appalled. They said it's destroying the personal connection. And then for generation after generation, alumni came back and said, that was the most brilliant lecture I've ever heard. That really made college for really and millions of people. And then they invented laptops. <laughs> That's right. I have another question. My question is how do you guys think that the new pedagogy and the old textbook will finally be able to encompass the complete, whole, true story of history and the humanity that built Richmond or America. When are we going to have an inclusive, mm -hmm. excellent source of information? I cede my time to the gentleman from Richmond. <laughs> as long as we imagine we're going to fit American history into a textbook, we're fooling ourselves. Right. The, the technology is going to be some other form. Uh, the, the future is what Peter was talking about. As long as we think we can, if we, we can just, and I've written four editions of a textbook so I, and that you try to make as inclusive as possible. As long as you're shrink wrapping it into two double columns and a certain number of pages, it's not going to work. So that's the reason I do think you know, what. Ed, will there be boxes that say historian, when historians disagree? Yeah, there will be, and it will be as long as we'll have those. Boxes. And there'll be a box that said, "Here's somebody we couldn't fit into the story. Uh, here's a woman. Here's a person of oh, color." Oh, oh, yeah. So yeah, I, I think that one reason that you're going to see textbooks dissolve, and that they will be replaced with multiple forms of knowledge, that are going to be in an electronic form. Yes, <laughs> uh, it's happening before our eyes. But then the challenge, I think, uh, Ed would agree, is they can't oh, we'll be on see. different planets. We have to find a way, just as we use that trope or that metaphor of a broad street, we have to be talking to and with each other uh, and, and bringing things together. I think that's the spirit of it, but it can't be in some kind of authoritative single text which inevitably is going to betray the biases, even if the bias is toward diversity. Correct. How, do you see humanities being the center of what the future should be based on? As long as it's the Virginia Hello? Foundation for yeah. the Humanities, that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> hey, maybe the last 40 years, we can make it another 40. What's, what other question we have? Yes. I'm trying to kind of move around the room a little bit, and also to, to give our young colleagues here a chance to get as much exercise yeah. as possible. Yes. At, at a time in the, pa in the past, a group of people was enslaved by a very small group of people who had a lot of influence over their lives. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, um, we have technology which is taking another group of people, our young people, and basically enslaving them into an information-based techno <coughs> technology-driven civilization. How do you see the interaction between those two? And can we resolve the issue of getting our kids to stop using their thumbs? <laughs> I'm sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> uh, 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 he's got a text, he's got a text. I, I would, uh, I'm gonna, we're starting to need to get started giving shorter answers so we can have more questions. Uh, I read an interesting editorial in the New York Times yesterday that said, 
There's no evidence whatsoever that people have shorter attention spans. We, we may be testing that this very second, but uh, <laughs> that, that there's no evidence that we actually are enslaved by the technology, that people always would have looked at something interesting and shining and moving if they could have. Uh, and that what we found at the university, we renovated our library, and we're trying to keep up with these hip young people. And one of the things they asked for was a space where people didn't have their computers and phones working, mm -hmm. behind glass. I think the new generation, is, it's like, They've grown up with it, ooh, great, wow, a phone that can do this or that. So I think it's actually going, to, I don't think we will be enslaved, but I do, th and I do think that more information is better than less. What's gonna be a shortage, and I, this sounds like shameless pandering, is what the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities does, which is to make sense of too much information. Okay, so we don't have any trouble Googling anything we wanna find, but how in the world do you fit it together into a story or a narrative? So, and I think uh, what you're getting at is the price possibly of ultra connectivity is a loss of the interior life. The I'm sorry, what were you saying? I, I, uh, yeah, I know. Uh, uh, and that is uh, the relationship between you and a page or even you and a screen, if it leads to sustained reflection and everything else, you're entranced, you're connected to something outside of yourself rather than that constant reaffirmation of yourself, even creation of yourself. Yes, I got an email. While, while you were talking, I got an email. It was so great. <laughs> yes, in the back. I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson. No. Imagine the three of you were designated to do a redo of Monument Avenue. <laughs> Can you name six people that you would like to put on Mon Monument Avenue from, from, from this here? pack? I think it's only people who don't really live here who should answer that question. Uh, <laughs> Brian, Peter, because they, they can go home after they answer. No, I, I think the real challenge with, uh, with monuments is to understand they're there for reasons and we need to reflect on those reasons. Uh, and uh, a monument can be a touchstone for civic consciousness and rethinking our history whoever, whatever is portrayed. A little respect for those who sought to memorialize their past and who envisioned their future. That doesn't mean it's ours, but I think it's a, a real challenge us to, uh, to us not to be intolerant, not to insist on homogenizing the past according to now uh, uh, an image of, of what we think the future ought to be. The temptation is to impose a vision, the, the great, Need. So what you're saying, demonumentalizing is another form of monumentalizing. I think it is. I think it would be the monument to this moment in time. So what I think is that we have a wonderful monument in Richmond, one of the most recent ones that's gone up, and it's on Broad Street behind a, a fence or two, of the Civil Rights Memorial on Capitol Square. And that's the kind of memorial that actually embodies what we're talking about. It's not a monument of one person. It's a 16-year-old girl who said it felt like I was reaching for the moon, but she's surrounded by all the other people that helped her move history. Now, I love you looking around the side, and there's a minister. You're looking around another side, those are the lawyers, Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson, Jr., who helped make all this happen. So I think that we are finding our way toward a monument, and what else is it? It's on the ground, and what else is it? It's of human scale. And so I, what I like about that is that we're realizing that you don't actually serve history by putting somebody up on a column so tall you can't possibly reach them or a horse that's impossibly big, but rather you realize that history is made by people like us and, that it take, and it's a collective, not an individual effort. So I don't think that people were doing Monument Avenue today, they would make the same kind of monuments. I think we're already seeing what kind of monuments they would make and they're the ones that we've recently put up and celebrated. And I think we need to walk the city in different ways. I urged a broad street, but I also would urge us to learn from Maury McInnes about the slave trade and the places of the slave trade in Richmond. Well, how convenient that they can in a, an exhibit that's right behind us here. Yay! Yeah, that, All that's right. right. So we have time for one more question. And make it really good. Oh, we, okay, there's two. So no, no pressure, I, no I'll pressure. I'll leave the people with the microphone to determine who gets to ask that last question. Hi, um, greetings. I'm one of those um, senseless millennials enslaved by my phone. <laughs> <laughs> hey, free at last. <laughs> 
So I actually, I grew up in um, Mannequin Sabbath at, in the other far, far end of um, Broad Street, um, past Short Pump, before there was a Short The pump. world doesn't just fall off after Short Pump? <laughs> no, it doesn't, it doesn't. And so I was one of those kids that said I would never go to Short Pump because of all the trees that they cut down. Um, I grew up with those. And so my, my journey down Broad Street has actually been the opposite way. It's been into the city of Richmond. And it'll be to the exhibit at the Valentine um, called Made in Church Hill. I'll be going there. And I think that's one an exhibit that really shows the connection of the past and the future of people who made Church Hill as, as residents of the neighborhood, long-term residents, and people who are making you know, local economies by making their own um, you know, pies and clothes and um, are real entrepreneurs. So I guess, could, could you speak to that journey down Broad Street and that future? Well, it kind of goes back to the first question about people who don't want to go all the way out to Short Pump. <laughs> Our history, I think, in a productive way here in Richmond and maybe across the country with the rebirth of interest of you young people in the artisanal, in the handmade, in the authentic, it seems like it, it, it made it that far and it's kind of doubling back on itself. Why does West Broad Village look like the fan? Because the fan's freaking awesome. We'd like the idea of people being close to each other and walking to places and people not exactly like you living next door and people are parking their cars. So it's interesting to think that recovering a past for the future is not necessarily going backwards. It might be going back and saying, you know, what were we thinking about when we thought we would all have jetpacks and we'd all be flying around? Instead, sometimes it's better to walk. And sometimes it's actually better to be inconvenienced a little bit, to not have the most efficient thing you can possibly have. And I think it actually is a result of living with so much technology that people are interested now in the tactile and the real. And you know what they're also interested in? Slow food. Well, that, but <laughs> that's not what I was getting ready to say because oh, yeah. I'm building to a conclusion here, Peter. Brian, do you have any relevant thought you'd like to throw in on? Here you go. I wouldn't get in your way. Okay. I, I wouldn't get in your way. I'd the fact that people would actually subscribe to a podcast about history, about American history, seemed deeply improbable to us who do this for a living at the beginning. And why do they? It's because we're re discovering, just like when you come back into Richmond, when you go to Churchill, when you go to the fan, that there are past that we've not thought about, that there are riches in foregone years that we've bypassed, and that any future worth having is going to have the best parts of the past in it. So and, and since on our show, the reason we're edited is that each one of us feels compelled to end the show. <laughs> and we usually take, I mean, this is, this is longer than the longest of a Beethoven coda that goes on forever and ever. But what I will say is on the show, what we love is when people phone in and ask questions and confront us with perspectives that frankly we just hadn't thought of, like the one you just mentioned. And in fact, that is how history gets made, not by just professional historians sitting around, yeah. even ones as talented as Peter and Ed. It's, it's by engaging it's the uh, collaborative with, with folks process. like you who are right. uh, sitting out there. And so that's, that's really what I love about this show that I do. But you know what? We don't really do it by ourselves. And we have, this Some is our chance to thank the We have right. a chance to thank all the people who make this possible. Before we go, we want to take a few minutes to thank many of those people, but certainly not all of them. First, to the Backstory staff, Tony Field, Andrew Parsons, Nina Ernest, Kelly Jones, Emily Gaddick, Jamal Milner, and Robert Armengol. Coley Elhai is our intern. An especially big thanks goes to Andrew and Emily, who stepped in to direct the show when our senior producer, Tony, got sick. And it wasn't just getting sick of us. Yeah. And our, our executive producer is Andrew Wyndham. And we thank him for arranging everything and putting in so many long hours to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. And it's unfortunate that he's all, also sick. And uh, when you see either of these guys lie, uh, and say that the show <laughs> was, it was better than ever. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks also to Maggie Guggenheimer, Elizabeth Piper, and everybody else at the VFH who helped put this evening together, and to Gene Osborne, who composed our Meet the History Guys song to the tune of Meet the Jetsons. 
Finally, we want to thank all of Backstories funders who continue to make all of this possible with their enormous generosity. They include the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Joseph and Robert Cornell Memorial Foundation, the University of Virginia, Weinstein Properties, an anonymous donor, and the History Channel. And last but not least, a thanks to all of you. You've been a great audience. Thank you. hard act to follow, <laughs> but give me a minute or two. First, they already mentioned that Laurie McGinnis is here tonight. Laurie, is, why don't you stand up so they can Please. at least Yay. recognize you when they see you. <laughs> yeah. And she is responsible for the exhibit that is here in the library that we've remounted with her leadership and with the library's uh, complicity and their serious and extraordinary work along the way. This is an extraordinary exhibit, and it's about Richmond. Uh, so do plan to take a visit through. It begins out in the atrium. It goes around through exhibit hall, comes back on this side. And Maury will be around and here, glad to t take people along. I do think it is well worth your while, and it's a grand example of our fellowship program because she wrote, spent a year with us at the Virginia Foundation as a fellow in residence uh, working on a book, Slaves Waiting for Sale, that led to the exhibit that is here now. So plan to join us. Uh, thanks to the three history guys. They are a hard act to follow. And in some ways, I feel like things that I might have wanted to say, they cover so much better than I would have that I'm going to just drop it right there and let it go. <laughs> uh, the very idea of the way that history can be explored and how it can lead to the discovery of history is an inspiration for the Virginia Foundation and the motto that we chose some years ago now. Uh, thanks to Barbara Freed and Liz Young uh, and the board of members that are here with us today uh, and members of the administration, the governor and the lieutenant governor, uh, general assembly members, uh, Congressman Scott and others. We're grateful for your support of us uh, morally as well as financially in some cases, but really how you care about this organization and help us care about the organization as well. A couple other things along the way here. One is that I'd heard that today might be Ed Ayers' birthday. <laughs> and hang on just a second. Some people will do anything for a moment of attention. <laughs> I'm going I'm to come back to Ed. But we have a beautiful reception outside in the atrium. Please plan to join us. I think there's food enough for dinner, certainly more than I could possibly want to eat myself. But this is the 40th birthday of the Virginia Foundation. And I learned today that Ed is also celebrating his 40th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and I would hope that as we stand and go out into the reception that we sing happy birthday to the foundation and to Ed. So uh, please join me. Thanks for being here. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear BFA. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Yeah.